All right, let's get him back to a microphone. Tommy Pico. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Um, good morning. I had a cup of cocktails last night, so I'm feeling a little bit, uh, you know what I mean? Not in my 20s anymore. Um, so I am not, I didn't really like, hmm, sweet water. I didn't really like come up in academics or nothing like that. So like, I am not a professor. I'm not a lecturer. I don't really know how to do this. So. Uh, I'm just gonna like talk at you for a little bit and like tell you a little bit about um, alternative forms of publishing. And when I say alternative forms of publishing, I mean other than like getting in a journal or something like that, because that's not really how I came up. Um, and like just to let you know if w anything that I'm saying doesn't jive with your personal philosophy or you don't really agree with, stay with what you know because everyone is their own intricate human process and I only know what works for me. So I kind of came up, well, actually, before I tell you about that, um, my goal has always been to write as often as possible. And these are just strategies that I got to get myself writing every single day because for me, writing doesn't live in my mind. I actually have to start writing. Um, I have a friend who's a short story writer who says he thinks through his stories a couple of times before he ever starts to commit them to the page. And if that's the way that you work, that's the way that you work. But like, I can't think through something. I actually just have to start writing. The other thing though, is that I find writing super duper intimidating. I mean, I'm intimidated by most things. So I have to make them palatable to me before I can actually like start to express myself or whatever. And if I started, if I sat down with the idea that I had to write a beautiful poem or that I had to be smart or that I had to be insightful or that I had to be funny, I'd never be able to do it. So um, anytime I find a strategy to get myself to write and to stay in the chair, I just use that, I keep it with me and I put it, I keep it like in my pocket as a part of one of my strategies. And the other thing is that like, I don't personally believe in like the muse or like in inspiration. That's just me. Um, I don't mean to break any hearts, but like, I mean, what I mean by that is like, I don't believe in waiting for inspiration. Like I don't believe in waiting for something to click in order to get me to start writing because my goal has always been to write professionally. And that means like writing as a utility, which means like writing every single day. And again, like um, if I was to, wait for something, I might not ever get anything done. Um, there was a writer, um, I, I, I listened to this interview with a writer and a TV show runner who does the TV shows Fargo and Legion, which are two TV shows on FX. And he's the show runner for both of them. And the interviewer was like, how do you write these two TV shows and also like do all this other shit and then like have a family and stuff? And the guy was like, um, the reality is there is no muse. Writing is a craft, and the inspiration for writing has to be the writing itself. And I found myself agreeing with that. You might not, and that's totally fine. Um, so another reason that I've had to find my own validation in the world of writing is that I don't know how many of you know this, but like people aren't really out here, like journals, the academy, etc. they aren't really out here caring about what a fucking gay Indian person has to say. So like I had to find validation in myself before I could ever find validation in anything else. Um, before I, I had to accept my own self, my own writing before a journal would ever accept me because I can't hinge my self-worth on somebody else accepting me. That's just not how I would work in this world. Um, it's like people ask me all the time, like how does it feel to like have a book in the world? And I don't really know because that's not where I found my validation. Like I was putting zines in laundromats for like 15 years before I ever had like a book contract. Um, and because my goal wasn't ever to have a book, my goal was just to write. So I try to keep it as simple as possible. And another thing that I have to say is like, if you use this method that I'm about to like talk to you about, like it's gonna suck. Like it's gonna suck for like a really long time. Um, and that's also totally okay. <laughs> um, 
the only way I got any better was by doing it. The only thing that I really had faith in is that if I did it and I did it as often as possible, like what I would be doing tomorrow would be better than what I do today. And what I did two days from now would be better than what I do today. And what I do three days from now is gonna be a little bit better than what I do today. That's the only thing that I can really have faith in. Um, I think about it a lot of times like running. So like now, I run like 30 miles a week. But when I started out, I couldn't go for two minutes without getting winded. So my goal was to run for a minute 30 every single day for like two weeks. And then I could do two minutes, and then I could do five, and then I could do 15. So it's this idea of like incremental process. So the first thing that I ever wrote were zines. So they're like these self-made like pamphlets that you can copy in Kinko's and then you staple on your own. Um, I, when I was like 15 and shit, like I would go to punk shows and I was also broke. So I would sell zines outside of the punk shows so that I would have enough money to go to the show. Um, and in that I learned like the value of production over the value of like quality or goodness because I thought like, as a rubric for success, this idea of goodness never really sat well with me because I'm never gonna be good enough. I'm not like, I am a perfectionist and I hate everything. So like I can never, I can't hitch my wagon or whatever to this idea of goodness. But one thing I can is this idea of honesty as, as a rubric for success. Like, I think I can make something more honest, but I don't ever know if it's gonna be good, you know? And it allowed me to learn how to let go of the writing because I would just, like I said, I would leave them, I would make them and like leave them in laundromats, in cafes, in takeout places, like any place that people wait, like where, where people wait for their prescriptions, you know what I mean? Cause like when I'm sitting in those places and, and this was a little bit before the era of smartphones, but when I would sit in those places, I would think like, I would read anything that anybody put in front of me right now. Um, and it also gave me anonymity. So even then, I would call myself Teebs or Hey Teebs. Like I would hide behind like a persona so that I never felt again too precious about the writing or that it's, uh, it needed to reflect me in any kind of way that I could like create a character and that I could make the world whatever I wanted it to and I wouldn't have to adhere to like the facts. Although like, it, but because of that, because I got to hide behind an alter ego, I could also be like super duper honest about shit that I felt that was maybe a little bit messy or a little bit complicated or maybe that implicated other people or implicated myself. Um, and again, like it allowed me to be the arbiter of my own self-worth and I started to find a community of other zine makers, um, which led to Birdsong, this anti-racist, um, queer positive collective, small press and zine that I did from 2008 to 2013. So when I was an undergrad, I did not study writing at all. I thought I was gonna go to medical school, so I only studied science and like physics and like, you know, statistics and shit. I was really bad at it, so I didn't matriculate <laughs> to medical school. But um, after it was over, I moved to Brooklyn and I kind of started getting into poetry again and I went through this really bad breakup, and spoiler alert, this is gonna be a recurring theme throughout the entirety of this seminar. But I went through this really bad breakup, and I was like walking the streets of New York, kind of in a daze, and I stumbled upon this bookstore called The Strand. And there was a reading that night from Sherman Alexi, and I was like, oh my God, he's like this, a person who, I read his book, Summer of Black Widows, when I was in seventh grade, and it was this American Indian poet from a reservation who was like making it big or whatever, and I was like, if he did it, I could motherfucking do it. So this is a person who'd been like a source of inspiration for me for like years at that point. And I went up there, and the reading was over, and there were maybe three people left in line to get their books signed. And I was like, oh my God, I can't fucking do this. I can't fucking do this. And I hid behind a bookshelf, and my friend Milan happened to be there at that point. And he was like, what's going on? Like, talk me through this. It's like having a motherfucking panic attack. And he, I was like, um, so my favorite author is on the other side of this bookshelf, and like, I can't talk to him. And he was just like, um, bitch, you have to. <laughs> um, I can't remember his exact words of advice, but um, he was like, you don't have to be anything and you don't have to say anything. You just have to go over there, shake his hand and say thank you. And I was like, great, I can actually do that. Um, 
And I did that and I said, you know, this thing about Summer of Black Widows and I was like, if, you know, if it wasn't for you, I don't know if I'd ever made it off the reservation. Thank you so much. And, you know, he got that like glimmer in his eye and he gave me his email address. We've kind of been in contact ever since. But my one, um, the, the one thing that I'd wish I'd done at that point, because I was like, you know what, like I thought I was going to go to medical school. You thought you were going to go to medical school. Like you're a poet, like I'm a poet, like da 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 da, is that like actions actually do speak louder than words. And I really wish I'd had something to give him at that point. Like I had nothing to prove what it was that I was saying. So I started Birdsong, this like zine series that I did every other week, every other month. Um, and I didn't have that much work behind me at that point. So I just asked all of my friends. I was like, I was, at that point, I was in a community of other writers and artists and like musicians and shit like that. So I'd be like, one short story from you, one drawing from you, one poem from you, I'll put in a poem, I'll interview somebody, I'll bind it, we'll do a release party every other month, and that became Birdsong. And then we would do shows and we would do other readings and I would do these like fundraisers so we could like fund the zine and all that kind of shit. But that became something that I could then give people. And I did give people. And I got to interview tons of other people throughout the course of that zine series. And the other thing, so, so zines helped me in that regard as a form of, of alternative publication. But two, performance did as well. Because I, it might not seem like it now, but I had the world's worst case of stage fright. Like I could not get up in front of a group of people and open my mouth. And so what I made myself do, so I created this reading series through Birdsong so that I had to get on stage every other month. And I started to go to open mics because I knew that that would be a way that I could sell the work as well. That like I could, I, I could, as I read it on stage, I could judge whether or not it was honest by how it came out of my mouth. You know what I mean? So that became an editing tool for me as well. Um, and so I did that for, so I had to do that like every other month for five years and people started to ask me to come to their reading series too. And so that, so in, a, in, a, in addition to being a way that I could get my work in front of other people, it also became an editing tool for me. Um, but then at the end of 2013, I realized that in being an organizer of this, of this uh, zine series and this press, and we were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, I was neglecting my writing. I was using it as a form of procrastination. Um, and so I kind of put the series to bed. I did the best of five years. I did a Kickstarter. And then I moved to Berlin. And I was like, I'm going to focus on writing. Because a friend of mine lived there. And so I could get there. Uh, I could live there for free. And I just like subletted my apartment and I left. And while I was there, I met a couple of developers. I didn't know what that meant. They were app developers. I didn't know what that meant, but they were talking about how they were developing all of these like banking apps for Swiss nationals, and it was getting really boring. And what they really wanted to do was like something more creative. And so we talked about doing a poetry app together. And I, we worked on it for a while. Um, it was 24 poems. My roommate was a sound engineer, so we rigged this setup in my um, closet. So I read these 24 poems. So we turned it into an app where you could like swipe through and you could click on the poems and you would hear me read them. It was called Absent Minder. Um, and that was only up for like a year because you have to keep paying in order to keep it in the Apple store. And it was a free app and I didn't have any money at the time. So like, that's all it was. But again, it was like another form of like self-publishing that was like kind of outside of the, the norm. Um, when I got back from Berlin, I had started doing a poetry Tumblr back then, um, probably like around 2012, 2013. And I did these like video poems. So again, like doing like performance, I would do these things on YouTube where I would like read some poems. And I had a poem called Das Butt. Um, it was, yeah, it was a video poem. And a friend of mine reblogged it. And it was a very, like a very popular, um, a very popular Tumblr by a person named Mark Aguar who they reblogged it, who, somebody who was a, uh, a, a contributing editor for Bomb Magazine at the time saw it, asked me for some poems. I published through Bomb, and that kind of put me on like the mainstream literary landscape. Unfortunately, like six months after that, Mark killed herself. Mark was a uh, 
a fat Filipina transgender artist in America and apparently that's a death sentence. And I just want to, I have to dedicate my work to her um, and like sort of pay it forward. So I, I just, that's had been on my mind for a little while as I was putting this together. So um, I read this book called A Tape for the Turn of the Year by a poet named A.R. Ammons. And in it, he'd written a poem on very short lines on a piece of adding paper. And I saw that, and he would truncate certain words so it looked like texting, and I was like, what if I wrote a really long poem that was like in really short lines, that sort of, that was like an extended text message? And what my goal was, was to make this like the longest Tumblr post anybody had ever seen. Um, and again, like I wasn't thinking of it as a book, I was just thinking of it as like a really long Tumblr post. And so I read it in the summer of 2014 in front of a few of my mentors, and they were like, that's all well and good, but like if we want this to have permanence, and I know that like your work, at that point my work was all about impermanence. It was about putting things on Tumblr, it was about making things in zines, it was all about making it ephemeral. And they were like, it would break our hearts if you put this up and it was gone in a day. Like you need to turn this into a book. And before that, like again, I'd never thought of even having a book before. So this is, I'm talking about this as a transition between like me using solely alternative forms of publication and then me sort of thinking about it being like my work being in the larger world. So it was a byproduct of what I'd been doing, but it wasn't the goal. Um, and then with like nature poem, I, that was a zine that was a comp, well, it was a zine first. It was a 23 page zine. That's a combination of, I, I had like, for two weeks I stayed in Portland and I had given myself the, the, uh, the task of publishing one new thing on Tumblr every single day. And so in two weeks, I had enough material to make a zine. I also mashed that up with, so I, I like to think of Twitter as a repository for my punchlines. So like in, 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 in Nature Poem, the whole thing about like, gay men are the worst people ever because if they don't wanna fuck you, you're nothing to them but they love dogs, that was a tweet. That thing about like, I feel like I'm a ghost, uh, like last night I had a dream that I was a ghost who gave blowjobs and that's pretty much the experience of dating in the city. That was a tweet too. Like all of these things can become fodder for your work. They have to because you're writing them and this is all about your writing, right? Um, and then um, again, performance as a method of, of, of editing. So my mentors had encouraged me to turn IRL into a book, and so I did, and I sent it off to every publisher, every open reading period, um, every book contest, anybody who would take a look at it, and it was rejected every single time. So that was like maybe 36 rejections. Um, and I thought, oh, I was like, okay, I'll just put this on the back burner. Like, maybe this isn't actually a book. Maybe this was like that throat clearing writing that gets me to the actual book. Like, maybe Nature Poem is the book. Um, and so I continued to, but, but, but I was still performing a lot at the time and, and I caught the attention of an agent who was a very bad agent and she doesn't work anymore. Um, as an agent, she does real estate or something now, which is what she should have been doing from the first place. Um, but she was like, if you turn Nature Poem into a book, I will sell this book for you. So then I was like, I had this zine, Nature Poem, and then I have this, again, this paralyzing idea of like, how do I turn this into a book? And I couldn't. Like, the idea of turning anything into a book was again too paralyzing for me. Like, I didn't know how to do that. It was too precious. And I just, I spent like six or eight months spinning my wheels and it just wasn't working. So then in the summer of 2015, I just started booking a lot of performances because I was like, I know what works for me. <laughs> and like this idea of turning this into a book, that doesn't work for me. So I, so I booked a lot of performances with the idea that I had to write something new for every single one. And in that way, I mean, it was terrifying, believe me, it's none of this has been like fun or easy, but it's about finding something that's not so intimidating, right? So I started reading a lot and I was editing as I was reading and my reading caught the attention of Birds LLC, who was my first publisher. And they were like, do you have a manuscript? Again, not through any traditional literary means. This is just through performance. Um, and I was like, well, I do have a manuscript. It's called IRL. Would you like to take a look at it? And they did. And they saw enough promise in it that we were able to work on it together and turn it into the book that it became. Um, 
I also got commissioned by NYU to make a performance in response to a eugenics uh, exhibit that they had, and I ended up folding that into Nature Poem as well. So again, like turning everything in my life into fodder, including another horrible breakup, <laughs> into like like more fodder for this fucking book. Um, and let's see. So I had so I spent the time I spent that summer. Put, uh, I had like sort of signed the book contract for IRL. I spent the summer turning Nature Poem into a book, um, and then in the winter of 2015, I had another really bad breakup. So I, I turned like journaling into another zine, and I turned that zine into junk, which is like the third book that's coming out next year. Um, and after touring with IRL in the summer of 2016, so I finished junk the zine version in August, or in, in, um, in January of 2016. I toured IRL in the summer of 2016. I had another bad breakup in the fall of 2016, so I was able to write the second half of junk. Um, and I turned like, and it was around that time that I signed the contract for Nature Poem for that book, um, but I ended up turning Twitter, my old app, Absent Minder, and everything else, like all of my old work, like I cannibalized that into the third manuscript, which became junk. Um, and then the third, the next thing that I've been using in service of my writing is Instagram stories. So I recently started writing a manuscript, a manuscript, a screenplay, <laughs> um, <laughs> with a company called Cinereach, who, with the producer of Beasts of the Southern Wild. And again, them being like, write us a screenplay, I was like, Ugh. well, first of all, I said yes, because the check cleared. But <laughs> then I was like, you know what I mean? But then I was like, I don't know how to fucking write a screenplay. Like, so I was like reading how you do it or whatever, but, but coming to like a program like Final Draft, which is like the, the software for writing a screenplay and sitting down and being like, write this thing, I was paralyzed, I couldn't do it. And so then I started to think about like, okay, this is another exercise in writing. I mean, it's a little more than writing because it combines like visuals and shit like that, but I was like, this is a little bit, this is another exercise in writing. This is something I can do, but how can I come to this? I'm feeling intimidated again. Again, this is my roadblock in every single aspect of my career. This is intimidating. How do I turn this into something that's not intimidating? So I've been writing a zine version of this like screenplay that I'm working on, but I'm also using Instagram stories because it combines visuals with like text. So I, so I just go out and I just like start shooting things. So it's become like a rough draft for like ambient visuals that I could put into the screenplay or whatever. Um, and it allows me to try new ideas in a way that's like not gonna stick to me because it goes away in 24 hours. So like I don't feel intimidated anymore and I feel like creatively like refreshed and renewed. And all this might, like the thing is like, it might seem like stuff is like really happening for me right now because like I had a book come out and there's like I have a book out now and there's another book and I'm working on another thing and I've like designs on a million other stuff but the thing is like I've been out here since I was 15 like I already knew that I was this like other people are just starting to catch on right now so I feel like that's good that's like my parting lesson is just to like find ways of writing that don't intimidate you if it intimidates you you might be fine I'm just saying I get scared as fuck so that's all no, I mean, that's all. That's I'm done. <laughs> Screenplay is due July 25th. I might just want to escape everything, so I'll let you know. <laughs> I have two pickles. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my, 
Yeah, that's a good question because my creative pro my creative generation process and my editing process are kind of different. And because I have to, they're like stacked on top of each other. And because I, my philosophy at this point is like writing and producing as much as possible, I don't always have time to set something aside in a drawer for a year and come back to it later. So what I've learned to do is turn it into like, I, I kind of think of it as like two different type of brain activities. So in creative generation, I let go of the editor voice altogether and just write as much as possible. Like my idea is like just to not stop. And that might again happen in, in, in bursts. So I'm just I'm saying like it doesn't have to happen for eight hours a day, but I'm saying for like ten minutes a day. And then like get yourself up to doing it for longer than that. But it's it's just like getting it out because I always find that as long as I start, I will figure out what it is that I'm writing. 10 or 15 minutes into it. I'm like, oh, that was the thing I was supposed to be doing. Because I can never actually get away from myself. I'm always right here. How, however often I try to get away from myself, that doesn't ever really work. Um, so I do think you always come back to yourself. The other thing is like reading. So I'll read very intensely something for like 10 minutes. And like, again, because in my opinion anyway, in my experience, in reading and thinking critic and deep reading something and thinking critically about it, the things that I pick out are always things that I'm already, that are sort of ambiently in my spirit anyway. So like, uh, it's just more evidence that like I'm fucking self-centered and a narcissist. Um, so then like, so that's the generation process is like read something, write, 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 um, as much as possible and like don't look at it. Like, I, and I'm talking about like, this is what I do like five days a week is just write, 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 write. And then on the weekends, I take a look at everything that I've done and I just start chopping away everything that doesn't earn its keep. Because, and this is what I learned from Tumblr, is that like uh, every word is necessary. Every word has to be necessary. Because like when, when I was posting poems on Tumblr, I was competing with cat gifts, with like pictures of dicks and shit like that. You know what I mean? Like. Um, <laughs> parks and recreation memes. It's just like a lot of competition. So I had to like, I had to make things as sharp and quick as possible. Um, so yeah, it's a, so it's like having those things on top of each other and be, I, I had to be able to like look at something with like uh, 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 um, the idea that everything is good and then the idea that like nothing is good, I guess. Yeah, no, it, I had a very, my most recent crippling experience of writer's block was because I was trying to turn nature poem into a book when I didn't really know how to do that. And the way that I learned how to deal with it, and again, with the screenplay, like when I was like, oh, I have to write a screenplay? What the fuck is that? What's a character? What's a plot? Like, I don't know what any of these things are. <laughs> um, it was, I... I had to find out ways of coming to writing that were not intimidating. And also to understand that like, um, ju like sometimes, like what, like what's the blockage? I feel like that is like, like um, diagnosing what the blockage is and where it's coming from. Is it that, you know, you haven't done anything in a while? Maybe it's like, you need to actually stop writing and like fucking go out. You know, when like really like, I don't know, get your heart broken or like fall in love with somebody or like hang out with your best friend or like have a really good conversation with somebody, you know what I mean? Or like read a book, I don't know. But like if it's like, if it's like not enough input is happening, I think that means like maybe put it away for a minute. If it's that like um, you sit, like if, if the, the, the blockage that I mostly have is like if it's intimidation, that usually means like just like think of it as something that's not writing. You know what I mean? Like, just be like, I just want to talk shit for a while. Or like, this is like, again, like this is just a tweet or this is just a Tumblr post or this is just a joke or this is just, like it doesn't, like for me, it's like extracting the idea that it matters, <laughs> you know? And then like it becomes something that matters. Well, I think places are like characters, yeah. you know, like, 
Um, I was talking with somebody last night and she was talking about having like, uh, like family in New York, like having generational family in New York and understanding that as a place to like sort of come back to that like she doesn't necessarily identify with but still feels like is a part of her identity in some kind of a way. Um, I don't know how, <laughs> but I, um, I, think of, I think of it like describing anybody else, like describing a, um, Mm, like describing your best friend or, or describing, I don't know, like if this, if you were to describe the interior of this room, you know what I mean? Or if you were to describe the air in Tampa, I think it's like in, in figuring out what, what um, characteristics of that place stick out to you the most. Like what is the loudest about the place? You know what I mean? It's just like, if I was even to describe Tampa, I'd just be like, that I, it's like that Sylvia Plath line, like that thick air is murderous. Like I would breathe water. It, it's breathing water, you know what I mean? Like it's super fucking humid here. And so anybody who's lived here or who's been here is gonna be able to feel that, you know what I mean? So I think it's just like figuring out like what are the loudest characteristics of the place. Oh no. I mean, maybe, I, maybe they did, I didn't. I never considered that as previous publication. Honestly, because, and some people feel the need to tell people, like, I put this on Tumblr, or I put this in a zine before. I never do, I don't give a fuck. Like, honestly, no, but honestly, like, if it's something that I made at Kinko's and I gave to 10 people, fuck, that's not previous publication. That's me giving shit to my friends, you know what I mean? Like, if I wrote that in a birthday card, is that previous publication? You know what I mean? Like, if it, like, if I, like, you know, it's like writing something in a dedication of a book. Is that previous publication? Like, I don't think so. Like, I, but again, like, I don't have a relationship. I don't have the same relationship, I think, to literary publication that other people do because I came to it fairly, like, late. Um, and, and, and because I, it, like, it's not some, I just don't give a fuck about it, I guess. Wait, which poems? No, just like taking five poems and, and putting them together you know, as, a, as a submission to the major journals. No, because they ask me now. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is I don't have any work to send them because it's all out there. <laughs> Two, absolutely. Well, the one I don't know means that like, I don't feel like, it's not like there's a community house that we all go to, but there are a ton of people who I know just because of the internet, you know, or like we've kind of gotten into each, gotten, uh, into each other's work, or like I was recently, like so Grey Wolf is putting an anthology of like young American Indian poets together that I'm in, and so I've gotten to like, through that, like meet a lot of other people. Um, like Natalie Diaz, this um, lesbian American Indian poet, like put together uh, just like this, God, I wish I, I think, I can't remember what um, the journal was. It was like something like contemporary poetics and blah, 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 blah. Like a bunch of shit that you would never really remember because it like seems really indistinct and like academic or whatever. Um, but there were like maybe 15 poets that she had to curate for that that were all like American Indian. I would say like Tania Winder, um, Frank Wallen, B. William Bearhart, um, Natalie Diaz, um, Cassandra M. Lopez, Demian Dina Yaji. Um, there's just like, I feel like the contemporary landscape of American Indian poetry is really, really exciting. And I'm so happy to be a part of it because we're all so different. I mean, like, I should, because like, Natalie's gay and I'm gay and she's native and I'm native and like, she's from like Mojave and I'm from fucking Viejas and like our language, Kumiai and Mojave, like it shares like a common stock. It's like, it's like my, my language is like, 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 like Italian and her language is like Spanish. We should sound very similar to each other, but we don't. Cause like, you know what I mean? Like I live in Brooklyn and like she stayed on the reservation for the most part. And it's just like, I love the fact that like we're so similar and we sound so different and we're allowed to do that. We're allowed to like not be a monolith. You know what I mean? Like, so the variegation in American Indian writing right now is as exciting as the amount of people being represented, I think.
of offending people, people not, you know, rejection, people's responses, losing part of your fan base or what? Or I think that is another form of procrastination. Because you think about that, I mean, the, the way that that would occur to me. So it, it didn't really occur to me in the writing because, I mean, the writing of the poems, because again, like they were super anonymous and like on Tumblr and shit like that. So it was like, it was my job to talk shit, I felt like. Like that's just what, that, I wasn't thinking about like, I'm sitting here writing a poem. Again, it was just like, I'm up here talking some shit. But when it came to like, for example, the screenplay, I was like, what if like, because I was like thinking about this character who like hooks up in like hotel bars because of their like relative anonymity and he has like intimacy issues. Not me though. Anyway. <laughs> um, but then I was like, if this is like, am I demonizing like queer hookup culture? Is this like, am I going to be offending people who are like, you're like, you know, uh, you're you're being sex negative or whatever? And I was like, I haven't even written it yet. Like. I am contending with a perceived reaction to something that I haven't even made, that's procrastination. I feel like you have to get it out there first. And then if it, if it offends somebody, then you have to deal with that. Like that's a responsibility of work, like making work. But like, I don't know if that's something that, I don't, I was gonna say, I don't know if that's something that you can calculate, but I think it probably is. I mean, you probably know if you're being a fucking jerk. Um, <laughs> but do I, I don't know, I don't know if I worry about it. I worry about writing more than anything else, I think. When do you know in your heart a poem is finally done? Because I go through endless revisions of poems, I think, God, I got it. And then I go back and I say, okay, then I do this, and I do that, and then when is a poem, this sounds like a stupid rhetorical question, but when is a poem finished? I don't know, but you just have to leave things okay. sometimes. I don't think you can ever know. I think, again, like, I, like I was, as I was reading from um, IRL and Nature Poem last night, I liked it because I got to see how, like, where their similarities were and, like, where, their, where they drew sort of grappling hooks into each other. And one of the things that I noticed was, like, this constant sort of refrain that I have that I really believe, and that's, like, knowledge is a fallacy. Like, the, the idea that you can know something, in my mind anyway, is, like, I don't, because, I mean, that's, for me, I don't fucking know anything. So, like, all, all I can do is do things. So I don't know when a poem is done, but I just like sometimes have to leave and start something else and just be like, hmm. and okay with it being imperfect because like perfection is also a fallacy. So, hey, Hi, what's up? Um, I also had too many cocktails last night. Um, so, and that was just two. I know, right? I I, God damn, I, I was like, I can't put in contacts for this today. <laughs> And grilled cheese, thank you. I'm really glad that I, because if I didn't have that, I don't know what I would be right now. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, so, um, <laughs> hold on, that was push. Okay, so um, you, obviously, I mean, you're a rock star on stage, and we all saw that last night. And, and to like take a Xanax and like a, 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 a beta blocker. Like I, it was like, it was like, I was, I was like, like, I was like, like a skip away from a coma. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but the thing is like, I mean, I would get myself into a place where I could like physically stand on stage without fucking like my knees buckling. But then like, I couldn't fucking express because I was so cut off from my own self. And so I had to like find a way of, well, I mean, it wasn't I, I had to find a way, I did from doing it as often as I could for 10 years. Um, I think I was telling somebody last night, like, and they were like, oh, that was so good. And I was like, I've been doing this for 10 years. So if I wasn't good by now, I should probably stop doing it. <laughs> but, but again, it, but the thing is, it's like, 
doing it as often as possible, I started to understand um, that, for, well, for, for one thing, you can't control a crowd. Some crowds are like this, like super duper, like into it, you'll laugh, you'll do the ooh, you'll like, you know what I mean? Like there are audible reactions that crowds have. That is a good crowd and that makes you want to keep doing it. And that's when you're like, man, I could do this forever. This is fucking awesome. Sometimes, and especially in like bookstores, in well-lit bookstores, sometimes <laughs> in like, and sometimes in like um, in smaller classrooms. Sometimes in you you can never tell that like sometimes crowds are just like closed fists. You know I've read in, in museums before, like they don't know if they can laugh. They don't know if they can have an interaction. And in those moments, you feel like I never want to do this fucking ever again. Like this is horrible. Like I'm bad. This is this sucks. Like I feel like I'm good, but like I can't get a reaction out of these people. Um, and I had to learn that like, that didn't have anything to do with me. Sometimes that just had to do with the institution, with the crowd itself. Was it a Sunday or was it a Wednesday? You know what I mean? Were people, were people tipsy or were they stone cold sober? Was this in the morning or was this like at midnight? You know what I mean? Like, so to relinquish that amount of control, I had to be like, again, like sort of look inward and be like, am I doing my job? Because that has to be what, like, that has to be, like, where I put, like, the primacy of my validation. Am I, am I reading as loud as I, as I want to? Am I, like, giving the emotion that I want to give? Am I, like, do I crack myself up? Because if I crack myself up, I'll fucking laugh. And I don't care if anybody laughs with me. Yeah, it's, it's a sense of humor. I have one. <laughs> it's not on me if nobody else does. Um, so that was a part of it. A another part of it was just, like, this, uh, this intimidation thing and being like, doing it as often as possible that, that a crowd didn't intimidate me the same way it would the first few times that I did it. Cause that's true, you know? And it also has to be something, it is a muscle. I feel like it's a muscle that if I stop doing it and I come back to it later, I have to like relearn all of these things all over again. It's really frustrating. So I try to stay on it as often as possible. So I try to read like at least four times a month now just to like keep it up, you know? Cause if I let it go for a while, um, it's just, it's, it's like, it's like lightning in a bottle or something. Like I have to catch it again. my process is reading out loud as I'm writing and as I'm editing. Um, again, because if it doesn't, if I don't feel like it can come out of my mouth, <laughs> um, I don't feel like I can, I don't feel like I can put it on the page. Um, I hope that that gives an approximation of my voice to somebody who's coming at it silently, but that's another thing that I don't have any control over. And I, that's another thing that I have to relinquish control of. Um, so I don't, I think of all my work as being stuff that has to be read out loud, but not everyone is gonna do that. So I hope at least that the voice in their head as they're writing it is marginally as exciting as mine is. <laughs> It's a little bit, I mean, because, like, it, it is a saturation. And because of that, I, the only way that I know how to do anything is sort of like the blue whale approach, which is like take in everything and like shoot out what I don't need and just like keep the little bits of plankton. And those come from conversations with people. Those come from TV shows. Those come from podcasts. Those come from reading weather reports. But it takes, the, the, the hard thing I think with saturation is also um, paying attention because it's easy to passively consume everything, but when you do, nothing sticks. <laughs> um, so I think 
it's partially taking in everything, but it's partially like paying attention um, because you'll figure out what it is that you want to pay attention to because things will be louder than other things. It's like when we were talking about how do you describe a place? It's like you, there are things that are important to you based on who you are. So what you pay attention to is like ref reflects that in some way. Forever. Thank you. I love you too. All of you. I want to take you all back to Brooklyn with me. This has been amazing. <laughs> <laughs>